He's saying something has changed. You're no longer the same person. Everyone, we, when we come to Christ, we've been changed. We've been given a new identity in Christ. We've been given a new spirit, the person and power of the Holy Spirit who gives us the desire and ability to seek the things of God and put away our earthly, natural, sinful ways of men. You once walked in ways that were storing up wrath. But the, the question here, the unspoken question, would be why then would you keep living in those old ways? You've been saved from those things. So put to death all of those things. All of them, he continues. Well, this morning, um, I'm excited for where we're heading in Colossians uh, 3. This is a significant passage, and I'm excited to see uh, as Dane is going to walk us through this morning, this passage, and to hear from him. But before we do that, uh, let us stand and read the scriptures together. I'm going to invite uh, Laura McCreary to come on up. She's going to read for us this morning. Uh, as you're standing, you can turn to Colossians 3, uh, verse 5 is where we'll be beginning this morning. Good morning, family. We'll be reading from Colossians this morning, chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them All the way, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off that old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Well, good morning. Uh, My name is Dane Foster, and uh, I'm the middle school pastor here at Crossroads Church. Um, And I tell you that for uh, a backstory and and, uh, kind of the introduction of of this study. is that in the middle school ministry, we've been studying through the Gospel of Matthew. And we're at the, at the point where in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 uh, is the famous Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus' uh, very famous teachings uh, about his kingdom. And uh, it's taken us a long time to get through <laughs> just three chapters, and we're just now at the end of it. Um, but it's because it's, it's so rich. There's so much... Uh, involved in this, and it's all about uh, how things work in Jesus' kingdom and how vastly different it is from all the other kingdoms of the world, uh, including ones that seem very spiritual, very um, religious sort of kingdoms. Uh, He starts out the series of teachings with the famous Beatitudes, um, where blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and the kingdom of heaven just continually is, is this theme throughout uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And it actually starts out there, um, but we get a summary of the Sermon on the Mount uh, just a few verses before that in chapter 4. This is essentially the, the summary of all of Jesus' teachings, uh, what he was going around proclaiming. And it was this, Matthew 4, verse 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so last week, Andrew taught us uh, the beginning of of chapter 3 in Colossians. We have to start there before we really get into our passage today. Um, So I am going to ask you to back up just a few verses to verse 1, where we'll begin reading. It says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him 
and glory. And so Andrew, when he was uh, diving into this passage last week, uh, he started us by asking us a series of questions. Uh, What are you seeking? What are you thinking about? What are you aiming at? What are you dreaming of? And then he quoted from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 33, that says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so in this this very large uh, set of instructions that he gives his disciples, his citizens of his kingdom, uh, he tells us to seek the things that are above. Now this is something that we absolutely hate doing in our sin nature, is admitting that we're wrong. We don't like it. You probably don't like it. It's not fun to sit there and go, oh, my way of thinking, my way of of speaking, my way of, of acting is wrong. But Jesus calls his followers to repent, to stop, to turn, to change. Christians should be the first to admit that we're wrong in our thinking. Wrong when we get caught thinking in earthly, worldly ways, when we're using earthly, worldly logic. But it's still hard, and it's still uncomfortable. So studying through the Sermon on the Mount has been a mind-bending experience of humility for me. Uh, And as we recognize how so often, so easily, I start thinking in terms of self and sin uh, and just get comfortable with my complacency, uh, which is our smug satisfaction of oneself. And we must be reminded from time to time, I think we need to be reminded daily, uh, by our king, who is a good king, a gentle king, a loving king, that we must repent. That there is much more work to be done, and he wants to do it in our hearts and our lives. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's all going to tie in. Here we go. One of my favorite quotes from last week's sermon uh, really hit home for me. Andrew referenced Romans 6, verse 5, which says, For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Our passage reminding us that Christ um, died, and in his death, uh, he had defeated death. And so I love the quote Andrew, Andrew gave, the death of death through death. Um, And I wrote that in my notes immediately because I love that uh, because it's what he's accomplished through his sacrifice. And uh, we are united in that death by his death and that we have died. And that passage says that our life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life appears, verse four, you also will appear with him in glory. Referencing that there is life after this life for sure. But I want to point out that wonderful little statement in verse 4 that says, Christ, who is your life? And Andrew highlighted that with like seven Bible references. It was awesome. The one that stood out to me the most was Romans 14, verses 7 and 8. It says, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. This idea that we live to the Lord. Christ is our life now. He is over all. He shapes our daily life. We're to seek his kingdom at his word the way he wants it. He is the hero of our story. And that's hard for us Westerners to get behind. We want to be the hero of every story, right? Like, I want to be the hero of my story. But no, Jesus is the hero of the story. We want to be at the center of of our own little universe, our own little kingdoms of one, but we are part of a much bigger kingdom, his kingdom. And he gets to say what is right in his kingdom. Christ, who is your life. And in so many ways we can say that and interpret it, but it's with this concept, this understanding of who our life is, who it comes from, where it comes from, who has rights to it, who loves our life more than we do and knows what's best for it more than we do. With that understanding, now we come to our passage and our first command here. 
in verse 5. It says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. <clears throat> and I'll tell you right now, I had a very hard time in my studies this week getting past verse 5. Uh, Jake Freeman can attest to this as we talked in my office for a long time about this passage. I was perfectly willing to go down every little rabbit trail off of this one verse, and I would have just, the whole teaching would have been right here. And that would have been tragic for so many reasons. But it's because there's so much depth here. There's so much um, power just in this, this statement, this first phrase. There's brutality of it. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And yes, we see the therefore, so we ask, what's it there for? And it puts us back up to the verses we just went through. Um, we've been made alive in Christ. We've been <clears throat> raised with him. We're to seek after his kingdom, set our minds on godly things. Why? Because we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. And if we've died and have new life in Christ, then it should be the rudimentary questions that we're asking. Okay, well then what is dead? We've been made alive, uh, our, our, we've, we've been dead, now we've been made alive in Christ. What's put to dead then is our old self. And it's true because we've been made alive in Christ into new creations. And then the question that I ask myself is why then do we still struggle with sin? Why then as a new creation do I still desire evil desires? And a very helpful analogy um, I came across in my studies ties into this in verse 8 that we'll get into. <clears throat> um, but it's an analogy of, of putting something off and putting something on. Uh, and we're told from Paul, in, both in, to the Ephesian church and also to the church in Romans, some of the things that we're putting on. In Romans 13, 12, it says, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then there in, verse, or in chapter 6 of Ephesians, um, it goes on to describe the Christian life as a war, a spiritual war, um, a battle that is waging all the time. And with current events, we feel the fear of this acutely, wondering when this war might be brought to our doorstep or whether we're going to enter into the fight in a greater way. But the analogy that was very helpful for me was actually from World War II, and I'm a history guy, so you're welcome. Now the difference um, between two very important moments in, in World War II uh, for, for us was D-Day and V-Day, or V-E or V-J Day, okay? Um, D-Day was designation day the day we really entered the fight. This was the beginning of the war for us, um, and it was a massive undertaking and a victory at great cost. Now, VE Day was the day that we realized full victory in Europe over the enemy. But every day between D-Day and V-Day was a war. It was a battle. A hard-fought, bloody battle, day in and day out, wins and losses, brutal tactics, doing whatever we could to gain an edge over the enemy. The Christian life is lived out between D-Day and V-Day. We tend to forget that. Even in moments where we read this passage here in Scripture, and we think, uh, you, you read this idea of putting to death that which is earthly in us, and we think that somehow we will completely eradicate sin from my life, here and now. That if only we had some sort of elevated experience, that we would then experience full victory over sin in this life. And I'll tell you what that experience is. It's when you die. Or if Christ comes and returns and we stand before him in paradise. I prayed really hard that he would return before the sermon, and it didn't happen. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but that's V-Day. That's V-Day. True victory over, over sin and our struggles. That's when we're standing before Christ 
and in paradise with him. That's when the battle ends for us. D-Day is like when you enter the war. You're saved. You're brought out of the enemy camp. You've been strapped on in some shiny new armor, and you're put into the ranks of God's kingdom, and guess what? There's a war on. But we treat the Christian life oftentimes like a cruise ship, but in reality, it's a battleship. And we treat it like it's a playground, but in reality, it's a battleground. There's a brutal war happening for our hearts and our souls, and every day is going to be a war. And in war, there is death. The real question is, what is going to die? Now, Paul implores the Christians, put to death what is earthly in you. The war is raging, and your goal, kill what is earthly in you. Sin, worldliness, that which runs contrary to God and his kingdom. And worldliness hinders, even chokes out the growth of a believer's life in Christ. Remember the parable that Jesus taught his disciples of the four soils, or the sower or the gardener. Um, he went out and he sowed seed, planted the seed, which was his word, God's instruction, his truth. And the expected return from that would be fruit, a harvest. But there were several kinds of soils, and one of them, called the thorny ground, Jesus describes like this, Mark 4, verse 18 and 19, it says, and others are the ones sown among thorns. They're those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And anyone who's ever tried their hand at gardening um, knows all about weeds and how ruthlessly one must deal with weeds, or what may start as a very small problem very quickly turns into a jungle. You must be brutal with weeds. Poison them. Pull them up by the root. Bag them so their seeds don't spread. Smother them. Burn them. Kill them. Whatever it takes, or soon it will rob the garden um, and the plants you're trying to grow of nutrients, eventually shading them, and causing them to get sick and wither. So you must constantly be killing weeds. Letting them hang out is a bad idea. Watering and feeding them is a really bad idea. A waste of time and resources. Put to death what is earthly in you. Don't play around with it, don't feed it, don't coddle it, don't treat it like a beloved pet or like a weird uncle or an unused object taking up space in your attic, don't mess with this thing, we're told, kill it. Put it to death. So what are these things we're supposed to treat with such extreme measures, um, things described as earthly, so contrasted with things that are heavenly? But we're given a list by Paul here, and this list is in no way complete or total. This list Paul is using as examples of earthly things that we hold within us, sinful practices. And this initial list um, is largely one of private sins and motivations. So we're told sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And I could belabor this list, but I don't believe I have to. Um, Sexual immorality is any form of sex outside of the confines of marriage, as God defines it. Put it to death. Go to war with it. There's a constant battle against the cultural perspectives of this. We must fight to say, I will listen to what God says about sex, how he created it, that it is good, and he knows more about sex than anyone else and created it with boundaries to be used for the good of his creation. Our culture has distorted this so fully, so badly. Um, We're inundated with their beliefs that oftentimes, Christians, we we will watch movies and TV that is depicting sex and impurity and passion in such ways that we would be weeping with our brother or sister over the very situation if their spouse had acted in such a way as was depicted on television. 
and yet we're watching it unassumingly for entertainment. Don't play with that. Any pastor or counselor can tell you story after story after story of the damage that is done to families and individuals because of people's refusal to put to death what is earthly in you and to fight against these temptations. When we give in to them, we make a mess. We must fight. And then on the other side of this list is covetousness, which Paul says is idolatry, the worship of things. And really, if we're honest, most of American culture is based on the worship of things, uh, making money. To think that we can, we can play around with that and coddle that and let that grow and take hold in our lives is one of the great foolish practices of the Christian church in America and much of the Western world. Covetousness can drag a person to hell just as effectively as any other sin. It's what got Judas, wasn't it? Traded Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. What are we trading Jesus for? What stuff are we worshiping instead of worshiping Christ seated at the right hand of God? Now, please understand, I'm not talking down to anyone here. I struggle with this. This is a battle. And maybe in one area you feel stronger in, than, than I, but we're all in the battle. And our prayer prompt on Wednesday night going into the season of Lent, uh, preparing for our celebration of the, of the resurrection of Easter, it came from 1 Peter 3.18, but the prompt was this. Put to death the things of the flesh and make us alive in the Spirit. I need to be constantly praying that. And maybe you're thinking that he wouldn't teach the whole sermon on verse 5. How much more time does this guy have? Shh. Okay, I'll pick it up. Here we go. Verse 6. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. Now, this is a statement we really don't like to talk about these days. Uh, the wrath of God. Can there be a less acceptable thought in the modern world? Hell, judgment, wrath of an almighty God. And on account of what? Sin. But let's think it through. These are things God said will be bad for his creation. The creation he loves, he designed. And then he sees, he watches as his creation, us, as we do these things and make a mess of our lives, hurting his creation. And he sees this and he hates it. His wrath is against it and he will punish it. Now let's remember that God has paid out wrath on Christ. The death of death through death. But here Paul talks about this in a future tense as if it's coming, and it is. There is judgment day, whether we like to talk about it or not, whether it makes us feel uncomfortable or not, whether our culture sneers at it or not, God has made it very clear in his scripture that there is a day coming when his wrath is going to be dealt out, and either it will have been dealt out on the cross, and if you are found hidden in Christ, then you will have life in him. But if not, then that wrath is still on you, and you do not want to be in the hands of the Almighty God when he pours out his wrath against sin. Thankfully, I won't have to face his wrath because of the promise Jesus has made to us, the salvation that he won for us, so that concept isn't a terror to those who believe, but for those who don't. However, Paul is speaking about these things, and he's speaking about these things in past tense here, in, in this verse, for an important reason. He's saying these are the things, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Now, in these things, you too once walked when you were living in them. He's saying something has changed. You're no longer the same person. Everyone, we, when we come to Christ, we've been changed. We've been given a new identity in Christ. We've been given a new spirit, the person and power of the Holy Spirit, who gives us the desire and ability to seek the things of God and put away our earthly, natural, sinful ways of men. 
you once walked in ways that were storing up wrath. But the, the question here, the unspoken question, would be why then would you keep living in those old ways? You've been saved from those things. So put to death all of those things. All of them, he continues. Verse 8, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. So Paul gives us a second list here. And again, I don't want to belabor this list except to point out that this list is a bit more public than the last one. These are sins that oftentimes uh, spring up in our lives and we, we see these things, they explode out of us. Um, <clears throat> but they're also, uh, in many cultures, the, a list of sins that you might say are more palatable, um, a bit more acceptable by our culture. Even at times have been held almost as virtuous, um, even by some in the Christian church. But this list, um, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk, uh, again, by no means a comprehensive list uh, of, of things that we might allow into our lives. He is saying we must put all of these things away, not some of them, not the ones we think they'll be easier to kill off. No, all of them. Just working from the list that's here uh, would take me another sermon, but anger and wrath are a bit tricky, aren't they? Because we see anger and wrath of God and know that these things aren't necessarily sin. We can and should feel righteous anger. God's wrath is justified against sin. But the anger and wrath of man is rather obviously different. We get angry because we're hurt or frustrated by another person or power that has hindered our ability to do something we want to do, like make more money or enjoy the freedoms um, or spend time with the people I care about or even just entertain myself. Are the things that we get angry about the same as the things that God gets angry about? Like when you're running late and can't seem to find a parking spot. Or that the reflector on your car bumper came off and now you need to buy a replacement. Or that my children left their toys all over the floor again. Are these the things God is angry about? that he's storing up wrath over. We can go from angry to wrath and rage for the dumbest of things. And the first time we see it pop up in Scripture is Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, beginning in verse 5 of Genesis 4, it says, But for Cain and his offering he had no regard, so Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. There God is, is warning Cain about his anger, his wrath, that sin was crouching at the door, and its desire is contrary to the ways of God, the ways we want to be. Um, and we must rule over, defeat that sin, or it will defeat us and do damage to those around us, quite literally, in Cain's example. Human anger and wrath is so different from God. God, who is patient and kind and keeps waiting for us to turn to him so he can deal with that wrath on the cross. Our earthly anger leads to wrath, which leads to suffering, and we see it play out. We're seeing it play out on one of the largest levels our world can depict in Ukraine right now with the wrath of a, of a man in power. But you can see many versions of this same problem in our everyday lives, sparked from an incident on the road or an unkind word spoken in a marriage or a sour deal between business partners or rivals. And we start to think, how can I vindicate myself against this person? That's wrath. <clears throat> we got to pick up the pace. Malice or intention to do evil. This is a natural progression from anger and wrath. This intent to do evil. And I like the word natural here because th these are from our nature. 
If you don't believe me, you haven't spent much time around children. I have two. Uh, one of them just turned three, and the other is going on six. And if you hang around them long enough, you will know they are awesome, wonderful, loving little kids with selfish, sinful, sometimes devilish natures to them. And yesterday was a good example of that. Okay, but one way we tend to lash out in our anger, in our wrath, with our evil desires um, is with this form of slander he talks about, speaking evil things about others. Now, sometimes evil needs to be called out. Um, you see something truly evil and despicable going on, uh, and you tell someone about it in an effort to protect them or to correct them. But slander refers to something entirely different, much more sinister in nature. This is speaking falsely. This is speaking in order to damage somebody's character in the eyes of other people. Have you ever seen that play out? Or have you ever been on the receiving end of slander? It's not a nice experience. So what do you think we're doing when we talk to our friends and our family dogmatically about someone else on issues we probably know almost next to nothing about? Maybe it's an exaggeration. Maybe it's an educated guess. Maybe it's right, but you don't really care. You don't really know. You're telling it to someone anyway because why not? It makes us feel better to slay someone else so long as we're not in the crosshairs. And if you think that isn't a problem for us today in our culture, you haven't read your news feed lately. But if you have, you've lightly been reading anger, wrath, malice, and slander. Paul then mentions obscene talk here. And as our character devolves from anger down to slander, why would we think that our words would resemble the words of Christ? Will our words be uplifting, kind, patient, merciful, loving, or will they be vulgar, hateful things, full of venom and sulfur like the pit from where they come? What kind of words are you using at school, middle schooler, if you're in here, looking at you? Don't see any. They come to second. It's okay. What kind of language are we using on the job sites or on the phone with our customers or when we're trying to impress a date? or when we're trying to teach the kids in kids' ministry on Sunday morning? Are these things in alignment? Or do we try to scrub up a bit while we're at church talking with the religious folk? So we ask ourselves whether any of this is, is really that big of a deal. Can't we let the little sins, the acceptable sins, the cultural sins, the sins that were ingrained into us from childhood, generally they're accepted by our culture, can't we let those ones slide? And if I had more time, I'd tell you the full story of my 1998 Subaru Forester timing belt debacle. Suffice to say that getting the lines lined up of the timing belt is incredibly important. Um, even a slight variation from the intended design of that, uh, just one tooth off from that, uh, could cause major damage to the engine or cause the car to not start at all. And you can ask me how I know later. We can't ignore the seemingly little things or the whole thing can be thrown out of balance and cause us more grief later on down the line. And it's true of our spiritual life. We start making allowances for things that God hates these are the things that on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And yet we justify their existence and we don't even realize that they've handicapped us spiritually. And we wonder why there's no power in our engines, there's no wind in our sails. And it's because somewhere along the lines, we're quenching the Holy Spirit's power in our lives. And we've all got habits. We all have personality traits that we gloss over, that God calls sin. What are those things for you? What would be on your list? So far we've seen some sins that typically they happen in the private life, others that typically make themselves public, and now we're told of one that's directed towards each other in the church, in the family of Christ. 
Uh, and the point of me referring to this is that sin will pop up in every facet of the Christian's life, in public, private, and in the church, and it all has to be rooted out. Verse 9 says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So we have to put off the old self with its practices, those natural ways, those earthly ways. Then what do we do? Um, Well, we're instructed to put on the new self, which is a new identity, a new way of being, of thinking, of acting, of seeing. And this new self is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. The new self, the new image we're putting on is founded in God and Christ, put on Christ. And I love the image given to us here because it's, it's like putting on new clothes. And who doesn't like new clothes? Some of you don't. You like your old things. Even when they're tattered and torn and rats have chewed off little bits of them and taken to their nests, you're still like, this is, this is my shirt, you know? I will not trade this for anything. Um, I like putting on, on new clothes. I, I, I appreciate them. Uh, but I love this picture for us because um, we, in our own deeds, in our own forms of righteousness, uh, Jesus or God calls them filthy rags. And there's a, a much more specific interpretation people use for that, but I prefer the idea of wearing nasty gym clothes. When I played a lot of basketball, um, I had a uniform and you would sweat in that thing, and the next day, if you hadn't washed it, it would be crusty. And it, you'd put it on, and it would crackle as you put it on, right? And it's just from sweat that just hardened, and it's ugh, and it stinks, and it's dirty, and it doesn't look good, it doesn't feel good. But let's take that up a notch, and let's say that you had to wear that every day, from the time you were born until now. That could mean decades, decades. Everything from your baby spit up, vomit, blood, sweat, tears, snot, sewage. It's all on there. And it's all crusted over. And it's gross. So gross. Somehow it's just barely hanging on by the threads. That's the old self, the original outfit. But God has given us a new wardrobe. He's stripped that off of us, he's bathed us, and he's clothed us in robes fit for a king or a queen. Now, I like wearing suits. They're not practical in a lot of ways. Uh, Our culture doesn't really allow for them much here at this church, which is sad to me. Um... They may be a bit uncomfortable, but in certain situations, you know, wow, do I look good in a suit, right? Like, just love putting on a suit. Every guy looks great in a, in a well-fitting, good-cut suit, and that's my opinion. And my wife, she looks great in a dress. And I've been told that a woman wearing a $5,000 dress looks and feels amazing. I don't understand that. I've probably never seen one. But my wife looks great in a $20 dress from Old Navy, Right? She got it on sale. Everything's at sale on at Old Navy. Okay? But here's, here's what this is. This is like God took us out of those old rags, these filthy rags, and he's donned on us a custom-made bespoke suit or that $5,000 dress, right, and sends us on our way. And what we do when we sin, now that we've been set free from that, It's as if we see that pile of rags on the floor and we pick it up and we start putting it back on over the top of our fancy new new clothes. And it's ridiculous. It's a silly picture. We shouldn't do that. Nobody would do that. And yet this is what we do. We've been given a new self, a new image that's being renewed into the image of its creator. That means God's image, the original image that we were made in, right? Genesis 1, verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
from the beginning we were made in his image. And what messed all of that up? Sin. What threw that image out of whack and distorted the perfect image that was there? Sin. So why then do we think we could be offered salvation of sin as we pledge ourselves to God and then be okay continuing to live in that distorted, wicked lifestyle? It's not a good look. And it's not the look that we're going for. The look we're going for is Christ in whom there was no sin. Well, here comes the great news of all of this. Because if, if we're honest, we could preach a very similar message to what we've been looking through, verses 5 through 9, in any Jewish synagogue, a Buddhist temple, or mosque of Islam. You could find it in any self-help book on the shelves of Goodwill. You could just say, put to death, try harder, be good, um, be the new you, get rid of the old you. But the good news is that it's not about us that we can't do that, that we need to be made new, that Jesus has made us new by the power of his blood, by the creator um, God, who through his son, the Christ, the Lord Jesus. So read this with me now, our last verse, verse 11. It says, here there is not Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So we're being renewed into the image of Christ. And something very radical has happened to all of us, and it creates a very radical, unique thing about the family of God. It doesn't matter what your background is, your nationality, your skin color, your social status, your upbringing, your education, your checking account, the car you drive, the clothes you wear, none of those things. You are not defined by any of those things anymore. If you believe in Christ, if you call him Lord, then you are in Christ, hidden with him in God. Christ is all and in all. And where else in the world will we see this play out? That someone who's tremendously wealthy could sit across the table from a poor man and them not worry about that, feel insecure about that. When the guy with three PhDs can sit across the table from the guy who didn't finish high school and them not think about that. That the gal who grew up in a respectable home and a respectable neighborhood with a respectable career and family could sit across the table from the girl who had the exact opposite of all of those things and still be united. That doesn't happen anywhere at any other table in this world but the table of communion where we come to remember the body and blood of our Savior. And this should happen in the church. And I say should happen because it doesn't always happen. And I suggest to you that the only reason it doesn't happen in the church is when we fail to put to death the sins in our lives. Because we fail to put to death those feelings of superiority and inferiority. Jesus is saying, not in my church, not in my family. We stand on level ground at the foot of the cross and embrace one another in the love of God. So this is all, this is good stuff, hard stuff. The question is, how do we apply any of this? It'd be the easiest thing in the world for me to just tell you, try harder. Go out from here and go do something hard, right? And yeah, there's, there's some hard work involved. But it takes so much more than that. And so to, to answer how I'm, I'm going to apply this, I've had to ask myself three questions. The first question is this. Am I in Christ? Am I in Christ? I know many of you are, um, but I know it's likely that some of you are not. Have you ever relinquished your power, your say, your rights, your loves, your life to God who died for you? Have you said, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me? I believe in you. I am yours. I'm all yours. 
not, okay, now, Jesus, you're mine. I'm going to fit you into this, my little worldview and make a little bit of space for you. No, no, all of me is yours, that Christ is all and in all. Some of you have never done that. And if that's you, you're dead in trespasses and sins. And the wrath of God remains on you for those things. But it doesn't need to stay that way. You can right here, right now, ask God to save you and rule and reign over your life today. So if that's you, I encourage you, say a prayer right now that reflects that decision. And then please tell someone that you did that. Whether that's me or whether that's um, a person who brought you or whether that's uh, your spouse of 50 years that you've never told, um, you've been playing at this thing the whole time, tell somebody. Tell somebody that you are now in Christ. And for those of us who can say, yes, I am in Christ, the second thing we need to ask ourselves is this. What in my life needs to die in order that I might live in the ways of Christ and his kingdom? What needs to die? Half of the battle, I think, is just identifying the weeds and calling them what they are. Understand what sin is. When we start playing with sin, we start creating new scales and measurements for what we think sin is, how we define sin in our lives, we get in trouble. We need to use God's scales, his measurements. That a lie isn't a little white lie or a fib. That a curse isn't just a slip of the tongue or a figure of speech. We must not let culture define what is right and wrong. If we want to deal ruthlessly with sin, we can do it by letting sin be sin, according to the scriptures. Let God define what is sin. That sexual immorality is wrong. Idolatry is wrong. Getting mad about almost everything we get mad about is wrong. Speaking poorly of others is wrong. Refusing to own up to what is wrong is wrong. When Christ says, repent, it's because we're in the wrong. And Paul tells the Colossians, next week we'll get to it, to forgive each other. Why? Because they've wronged each other. We must identify what is sin in our lives and then deal ruthlessly with them. And I've found with weeds, it's best to do it all. Poison them, pull them up, burn them, whatever. Lay down a barrier of mulch and even plant something else in its place, and I'll talk about that next. But something needs to die, and we got to be radical about killing it off. If we've been tolerating something in our lives, we know it is not helping us look like Jesus. We must be radical about dealing with that thing in our lives. If, it, if it's the news cycles we've been watching or reading, if it's the shows we've been binging, if it's the friendships we've been cultivating, if it's the music we've been listening to, if it's the influencers we've been following, the books we've been reading, the teachers we've been taking counsel from, you know. And maybe you've known for a long time now that it's not doing you any favors. It's not a missionary endeavor for you. You've made any number of justifications for them in your life, and they've allowed to sit and fester and to squeeze our minds into the image of the world. What should we do about these things, Christian? Now that thing might be different for each of us. But the result should be the same. Don't keep it around as a plaything. It's a dragon that will turn and consume us. We gotta kill it. Third and finally, um, I alluded to it already in the imagery of the weeds and the soils, but the, the final question I need to ask is what needs to live, what needs to flourish, what needs to grow in place of these sinful habits. One of the best ways I've found to get weeds out of an area of my garden, and I'm not great at it, you can drive by my house and see, but constantly battling weeds is by planting things that I want to be there and to put down a covering over the areas where nothing is. 
because that's an area then that weeds won't grow. If I plant something good there, it will eventually outcompete those weeds. It will grow and take up space where no weeds will be able to get in if I care for it and I viciously root out the weeds that pop up near it. See, we're not just told to put things to death or put things off, but we're then told in the next verses what to put on, what to cultivate, what to encourage to grow. And you can read it on your own. I promise I'll leave it for Andrew to cover next week. And you're like, good, okay? The list, though, as you read it on your own, um, it sounds very familiar uh, to the list in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, known as the fruit of the Spirit. Ultimately, um, we will not be successful in the fight against sin uh, if we don't cultivate and encourage the fruit of the Spirit to grow in our lives. Let me read that list for you. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit doesn't grow if the Spirit isn't at work in us. So when was the last time we prayed that prayer prompt from Wednesday night? Hopefully, at least Wednesday night. Lord, put to death the things of the flesh and make me alive in the Spirit. Ask for the Spirit's help in this. He's there, he's working, he's waiting. He loved to be invited in to help us with this battle. It's a lifelong battle, one that one day will indeed end. But until then, there's no reason why we should fight it on our own strength. Just the opposite, in fact. Ask for the Holy Spirit's help. Feed the influences of the Holy Spirit, replacing those worldly, earthly influences and practices with heavenly, spiritual ones. And as we tend to this tender garden of our lives, I am confident we will hear the master's good pleasure in his voice as he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And then we will rest. But until then, we're going to keep fighting. And it is in the power of Christ that we stand that we go out and we fight this battle. Um, I couldn't decide where to fit in the rest of the Romans 6 passage that Andrew started for us last week. Uh, Jake Freeman and I agreed. I I think finishing off here reading this passage uh, would just be a great way to to close us. Romans 6, uh, beginning in verse 8, says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. So let's consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, who is our all and all. God bless you.